KTCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. So as a part of EM Rapid, we are going to discuss acute upper and lower GI bleed today. So first we will talk about the common uh, terminologies which we discuss in uh, GI bleeding, like uh, upper GI bleeding. Upper GI bleed is any bleed that is proximal to the ligament of treats. Uh, ligament of treats actually correspond to the second part of the duodenum. So anything proximal to that is uh, upper GI. Okay, so it includes the esophagus, stomach and the duodenum uh, just proximal to the ligament of treats. And next terminology is hematemesis. Hematemesis is vomiting of blood or coffee uh, ground coffee colored vomitus and it usually comes from the upper GI tract. Another terminology is melina. Melina is black tarry stools. Uh, the black color is because of the blood and it comes it, it becomes the uh, blood becomes black because of the degradation of the blood by the intestinal bacteria. Next terminology is hematochesia. Hematochesia is a bright red color blood from rectum. So either it can be because of massive upper GA bleed, because of the amount of the uh, GA bleed, the blood will not get much time to get degraded in the abdomen, in the stomach. So, uh, so when it comes to the lower GA tract, it will be red color itself. Or it can be because of a lower GA bleed or any bleed distal to the ligament of traits. Or it can uh, because uh, so it can be like small bowel bleeding like that or distal colonic bleeding or anorectal bleeding. Okay, these are the common definitions. Now, uh, first we will discuss about the upper GA bleed. So we told that any bleed which is proximal to the ligament of trace is known as upper GA bleeding, and it can be a overt bleed. That means it will be clinically visible as a hematemesis or melina. Or it can be occult. Occult means it is not seen by naked eyes. Uh, it will be visualized only in microscopy. So stool occult blood will be positive. Or otherwise it can be an obscure bleeding. That means a bleeding whose site is unknown. So site may be evaluated for uh, uh, either endoscopy, colonoscopy or endroscopy or other multiple diagnostic modalities like angiography something will be done. But the site of bleeding is uh, couldn't be diagnosed then that bleeding is called as obscure bleeding okay what are the upper GA bleed mimics mimics means uh, it uh, it will not be an upper GA bleed but it will be some bleeding somewhere else which we will think it as an upper GA bleed it can either be it will be mostly extra intestinal blood loss and it can be it can be nose bleed like epistaxis or any gingival bleed any tonsillitis pharyngitis or hemoptysis Usually, it, uh, epistaxis and hemoptysis will be confused with the upper GA bleed. And false positive occ uh, occult blood test, occult stool uh, blood will be positive if the patient is using red meat or consuming fruits like grapes or figs or consuming certain uncooked vegetables like cauliflower, radish, broccoli, turnip, etc. Now, what are the common cause of upper GA bleeding? So these are the common non-mericial causes of upper GI bleed. That is peptic ulcer disease which is the most common cause of non-mericial upper GI bleed or any gastroduodenal erosions, malary we stare, erosion esophag erosive esophagitis or any gastrointestinal angiodysplasia or gastric andral uh, varicellectasias or any upper GI tumors or if the patient is in hospitalized and is uh, in a mechanical ventilator for more than 48 hours and if there is any coagulopathy that itself can cause an upper GA bleed. Okay. Now what is variceal bleed? Variceal bleed is a GA bleed because of the rupture of the collateral portosystemic vascular channels or the varices. It is usually seen as a response to portal hypertension and it is a complication of cirrhosis and it is having high mortality and the types are it can either be in the esophagus so it is esophageal varices or it can be a gastric varices so most common varices in cld patients are esophageal varices or it can be because of a ectopic varices that means this, uh, some other site other than the esophagus or the uh, stomach so it can either be in the duodenum or in the small intestine or large intestine colon rectum biliary tree etc
now uh, common drugs which can cause upper gi blade so aspirin aspirin is written in the uh, upper gi so aspirin can cause uh, gi blade and use of nsa least commonly with ibuprofen then other things are acyclovir diclofenac and ketolac then combination of uh, anti anticoagulants and antiplatelets may be also be associated with upper gi bleeding and newer anticoagulation agents like dabigatran rivaroxab and these things are also associated with upper gi bleed so suppose a patient presents to er with upper gi bleeding what to do first we will have to do the initial assessment primary that is the primary survey then we will have to stabilize the patient's hemodynamics then we will have to identify the source of bleeding stop that bleeding and treat the cause then we will have to prevent the further bleeding okay so suppose a patient comes with upper gi bleed first we will have to differentiate it from the upper gi bleed mimics uh, first we will have to confirm it as upper gi bleed or a lower gi bleed uh, so melina hematemesis will be upper gi and hematochesia will be mostly lower gi it can be uh, seen in massive upper gi also then we will have to differentiate it from the mimics like hemat uh, epistaxis or hem uh, hemoptysis then based on the history we will have to uh, based on leading questions we will be able to find the uh, etiology of the upper gi bleed so if a patient comes with a history of multiple episodes of vomiting followed by retching uh, and then coming with uh, hematemesis then it can be because of a malary we stare can be associated with alcoholism and retching okay and if the patient is having dysphagia or dinophagia grd history and all it can be because of any esophageal ulcer or if there is a history of nsaid use aspirin use epigastric pain and all it can be because of peptic ulcer disease then stress gastritis is seen in patients in icu on mechanical ventilation with uh, with uh, mods coagulopathy and all stress gastritis can be there then a patient who is an alcoholic uh, uh, with and uh, with a background of cld and all there is high risk of variceal bleed and portal hypertension then uh, gave gave is usually associated with either cld or renal failure and if there is any history of weight loss dysphagia cachexia early satiety and all there can be a risk of malignancy and other conditions angiodysplasia angiodysplasia can be associated with Uh, renal failure or hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia and uh, aortic or enteric fistula is seen uh, in a patient who with a known case of uh, aortic aneurysm or past history of abdominal aorta aneurysm repair okay so uh, after the primary survey we will be um, exam we will be doing the primary survey and we will be noting down the vitals by taking the history we will be understanding we will be having some inference about the patient so which all patients we should be very careful or which all patients can worsen fast so uh, the adverse prognostic factors in upper gi bleed is usually seen in age more than 60 years or if the patient presents in shock with a systolic bp less than 100 or if there is tachycardia or there is a uh, known bleeding source like a malignancy or varices if the patient is in severe coagulopathy and if the patient is having other comorbid illness or if there is a uh, the patient present with a recurrent bleed or if the bleed is severe uh, so severe in the sense uh, patient can come with a history of massive bleed other than that if the patient is in hypotension requirement of more units of uh, blood products or if there is any bright red or massive gastric aspirate any history of syncope any hematemesis and all then that is severe and that this patient can worsen fast and endoscopically if there is a severe uh, if there is an active arterial bleed or visible bleed seen that is also a poor prognostic indicator and more than 4 uh, units of prbc required in 12 hours or a requirement of massive transfusion protocol okay so uh, this is all about the vitals initial vitals of the patient suppose the patient is coming to you and uh, uh, we will be assessing the patient with airway breathing circulation so when to know this patient requires an uh, airway uh, support like if the patient is having reduced consciousness 
or if the patient having massive hematemesis is aspirating blood and he's going to desaturation, the sensorium is uh, very much less so that he can aspirate blood. So consciousness is there, uh, reduced consciousness, aspiration. This reduced consciousness can be because of hepatic encephalopathy or hypotension or any risk of further deteriorating, uh, worsening or if the patient requires intubation for further interventions like uh, endoscopy or any SB tube or Minnesota tube insertion. So if, if we feel that the airway is not patent, we will have to intubate. Okay. So uh, there are some modifications in rapid sequence intubation. So before intubation, the uh, person who is in the head then will, should have to wear the personal protective equipment because anytime patient can bring out with the next episode of uh, hematemesis. So they should wear goggles, gloves, gown, mask and all. And patient should be uh, prepared for the rapid sequence intubation. Two large bore IV cannulas should be placed and all the blood products should be arranged and if required transfusion should be started and the medications of rapid sequence intubations and sometimes cause a hemodynamic compromise so if that is anticipated we will have to start on uh, vasoconstrictive drugs and or adrenaline or vasopressin according to the need and uh, head and uh, head up positioning so uh, the problem is uh, in up, uh, upper GA bleeding when we are doing a bag and mask ventilation and if, if we are keeping the patient in a uh, supine position, there is high risk of aspiration and also we, uh, ideally if possible we can perform intubation in 45 degree head and up, head up position. Okay, I will show the picture here. So you can see in this picture there is a uh, 45 degree position with the face parallel to the ceiling. This position will be ideal for a patient. Okay. Now the drug selection. Drug selection we can use ketamine because there is high chance of hypotension. So ketamine will not produce hypotension. So ketamine can be used 1 to 2 mg per kg IV or any low, um, it can, it should be used along with a sedative like uh, midazolam or not. So, uh, if at all we are using sedative, the dose should be low, especially in case of CLD patients because the uh, benzodiazepine clearance will be low in CLD patients. So, with low dose sedatives, uh, then, uh, then paralytic agents either can be procuronium or any other non-depolarizing agents and uh, succinthonium, anything can be used. Okay. And avoid positive pressure ventilation in these patients. Like uh, BiPAP and NIV, these things are contraindicated in case of upper GA bleeding. And if at all we are planning for intubation and if we are doing bag and mask ventilation, uh, it should be done properly so that the risk of gastric insufflation will not be there. So unnecessarily uh, bag and mask ventilation or uh, hyperventilation or giving extra uh, pressure on the ambu bug. These things can call gastric insufflation and it can precipitate another uh, upper GA bleed. So that shouldn't be there. So uh, ideally when we are doing bag and mask for these patients after giving paralytic agent, we will have to give only 6 to 10 breaths maximum in a minute. Okay. With the pressure less than 15 centimeter of water. Now, uh, before intubation, we can consider giving uh, gastric emptying agents like uh, prokinetic agents like uh, methoclopramide can be given, 20 mg IV uh, or erythromycin can be given. So, uh, the advantage is that these are prokinetic agents along with that it will reduce the lower esophageal sphincter tone. So, uh, during bag and mask and all, there is a risk of uh, bringing out of hematemesis. And... Uh, Another thing is that uh, we shouldn't wait for the prokinetic to act. So uh, onset may be too slow, so it shouldn't, uh, should not delay intubation. And another advantage of methoclopramide is that uh, if you are planning to do an endoscopy, it, since it is having a prokinetic action, uh, all the blood, everything will be cleared so that the bleeder site will be more visible. This we have already discussed. Now, uh, we can consider using met uh, meconium aspirator attached to the ET tube for suction. And we can consider using a salad approach for intubation. Salad technique is suction assisted laryngoscopic airway decontamination. This method also can be used for intubation. Okay. Now, 
after intubation the next thing will be mostly we will be in the head end itself we have a tendency to put the nasogastric tube uh, before intubation itself nasogastric tube is not ideally used because it can trigger vomiting and precipitating at the hematem so it is not used before intubation and even after intubation it is not recommended to use it because it uh, it is not much effective in completely emptying the stomach content and uh, it can anyway injure the varices so uh, ideally don't use a don't put a nasogastric tube now after securing the airway uh, airway is secured then the breathing after intubating the breathing will be taken care of by the ventilator next is circulation so in the circulation we will have to assess what classification of shock patient comes into if the patient is having less than 750 ml of blood loss and if there is an air, if the patient doesn't have any tachycardia and if the bp everything is normal then patient will comes in class 1 hemorrhagic shock if the patient is having tachycardia and if there is any reduced pulse pressure then patient will be in class 2 shock and patient will be in class 3 shock if there is any hypotension low systolic bp and if there is uh, if there is profound tachycardia uh, then uh, reduce your output elevate uh, ready, uh, base deficit less than minus 10 these things will be class 4 shock these both will require massive transfusion protocol so we'll have to identify what classification of shock patient comes into okay so uh, in resuscitation all patients with upper ga bleed should be placed on two large bore iv cannulas then uh, volume replacement should be done depending on the patient's heart rate and blood pressure and uh, ideally for volume replacement we can start with uh, crystalloids and then we can uh, depending on the patient's uh, blood pressure we can start on uh, vasopressors and then blood products blood products prbc and ffp uh, should be given if the patient is in coagulopathy and if the inr is more than 2.5 we'll have to give a fresh frozen plasma and PRBC will be given, uh, the uh, cutoff I will tell you later. And the platelets should be transfused if the platelet is less than 50,000. Okay. So, uh, in uh, medications for coagulopathy, in CLD patients and all, uh, vitamin K uh, dependent uh, clotting factors will be less. So, factor 2, 7, 9, 10 will be deficient and uh, there will be coagulopathy. So, vitamin K supplementations and vitamin K injections will take time to act. So, in these patients, we can give fresh frozen plasma or the best one is uh, four factor PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, will, which will contain factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. If that is not available, we can give FFP. Okay. So, and uh, before we are, uh, the aim is to keep the INR less than 2.5 before endoscopy. And uh, if at all the patient is on any uh, or direct or newer oral anticoagulation agents, uh, we can plan withholding that depending on the status of the patient and after consulting with the hematologist or cardiologist. Okay. Now the blood transfusion, PRBC cutoff. The target hemoglobin is more than 7 in uh, patients and it is kept a lower cut, um, a more higher cutoff is kept, like more than 9 is kept for patients with coronary artery disease or patients who is having high suspicion of vigorous ongoing bleed or a uncorrected coagulopathy. In such patients, we have to keep the cutoff as 9. Okay. Suppose we don't have an endoscopic facility or suppose if we don't, uh, if we are not able to control the bleeding, in such patients, we can insert special tubes like this. This will act as a tampon effect and this will reduce bleed. So, such tubes are Linton Nuclas tube is there, Sense Taker Blackmore tube is there, and Minnesota tube is also there. So, these are the differences in the tube. So, uh, the Linton Nuclas tube is having a 500 ml single gastric balloon. So, this should be inserted up to the stomach and it will, it gets inflated in the stomach and it is having a suction port in the stomach also. Okay. Next tube is a Sensitaker Blackmore tube. It is having an esophageal and a gastric balloon so that in case of varicell bleeding and all, it will create a tampon effect there. And it is having a suction, um, it is having a suction balloon in the stomach. Okay. 
and Minnesota's tube same as that of this SB tube, but there is a suction um, aspiration port in the stomach and also in the esophagus. And the major problem is using the tamponade balloons is that there is 30 percentage rate of serious complications like aspiration pneumonia, esophageal rupture and injury to the mucosa and airway obstruction. Okay. Now, in patients with upper GA bleeding, we will have to risk stratify these patients. So, risk stratification in the ER, it can be done either by a Glasgow Blood Score score or a cold score or AIM-65 score. So, the uh, best score considered now is Glasgow Blood Score score. And if the score is zero, then that rules out any urgent intervention. So, the score is basically used to know whether any intervention is required like endoscopy, blood transfusion or surgery. So if the score comes as zero, there is no urgent intervention. And if it is like less than one and all, it means that it is a, uh, it is very good. Okay. Other scores are Rockwell scoring and AIM-65 score. So first we will discuss about Glasgow Blatchford score. So its score uh, ranges from zero to 23. And if the score is more than six, that means there is more than 50% risk of requirement of a intervention like blood transfusion endoscopy surgery and all okay so what all are the components we have urea here why urea is important is if the patient is having upper GA bleeding the there is blood in the GAT so that blood gets absorbed to the systemic circulation and that will increase the urea so uh, urea is taken into consideration the hemoglobin of the patient is taken into consideration systolic BP and other parameters like uh, tachycardia, malina at the time of presentation, any history of syncope, hepatic disease and cardiac failure. These things are considered and depending on that we will uh, uh, put a score. So it ranges from 0 to 23 and more than 6 means definitely this patient will require intervention. And if the score is 0 that means this patient is having a uh, hemoglobin more than 12.9 in men or more than 11.9 in females and systolic BP is more than 109. There is no tachycardia and the uh, blood urea nitrogen level is 6.5, less than 6.5. There is no malina, no syncope, no uh, heart failure or liver disease. Then if that is coming, the score is coming as zero, no intervention is required. Other scoring is a Rockwell scoring system. Uh, that is the that will determine the risk of re-bleeding and death in upper GI bleeding. There is actually a pre-endoscopic and post-endoscopic um, Rockhold scoring system. Another one is AIM-65 scoring. AIM-65 is a simple score uh, there where they will be using albumin, INR, mental status of the patient, systolic BP and age. And if the score is less than 2, there is low mortality or um, hospital stay will be short and uh, risk of hospitalization also will be less. This, uh, it is almost equal to our CURB 65 score in pneumonia. Okay. Uh, this is not a restructification score. That is the forest classification. This is not a restructification score. If the patient comes with a non variceal bleed like a peptic ulcer, ble ulcer bleeding basically, the, this is, uh, we do an endoscopy and based on the endoscopic findings, we will be classifying the patient into a forest classification. Okay. And if the patient, uh, uh, there are mainly three classification, one, two and three. Okay. So, a patient will be in 1A if there is active arterial spurting of blood. It will be 1B if there is arterial oozing of blood. It will be 2A if there is a visible blood vessel seen. It is 2B if there is a sentinel clot seen. It will be 2C if there is any uh, a spot seen, that a hematin covered flat spot is seen. And 3 means there is no hemorrhage. So, uh, as I told before, 1A we can see an arterial jet going like this here. Then 1B is oozing. 2A is a visible blood vessel, 2B is an adherent clot, 2C is a flat pigment, red pigment seen here and 3 is a clean base. Okay. Now in the ED, 
what how will we manage upper GI bleed so we told about the airway the intubation part we have told then the uh, air, airway breathing then circulation we told what are, are the uh, initially how to identify the patient uh, we will have to classify the type of hemorrhagic shock what all things to be given what all are the transfusion cutoffs and all then after that uh, we uh, what all medications to be started in the ed okay so we will have to start on proton pump inhibitors that is to maintain the gastric ph it is mostly used in case of ulcer bleeding so we can give omeprazole or pantoprazole 80 mg followed by a continuous infusion 8 mg per hour infusion and uh, and it is helpful and it can reduce the requirement for endoscopic therapy but endoscopy with proton pump inhibitors will give a best result okay so this 8 uh, this 8 mg per hour bolus can be this continuous infusion should be continued up to 72 hours and it is mostly used in case of ulcer bleeding in case of ulcer bleeding we will have to continue up to 72 hours and if it is ulcer bleeding we can we will have to start on sucralfate also sucralfate that can reduce uh, that can increase the mucus secretion in the stomach and this uh, it will cover the ulcers so the mucosal blood flow everything will be uh, increased and there will be local prostaglandin production so sucralfate is used in ulcer bleeding other uh, other uh, things can be H2 receptor antagonists can also be used. Okay. Uh, ideally, it is not advised to start sucralfate before OG doing an endoscopy because if it covers the uh, ulcer, ulcer mucosa and all, and if it increases the mucus secretion, we will not be, uh, we will not be, um, it will be difficult to identify the site of bleed. So, uh, after confirming it as an ulcer bleed only, we will be planning on starting sucralfate. So, uh, before uh, doing an OG discopy, first start on pantoprazole infusion. Then other medical management, this is done in case of variceal bleeding. Okay, so, we started on pantoprazole infusion and if the patient is not, the, is a known case of variceal bleed or, or if the patient is a known case of uh, liver cirrhosis and all, we will have to start on uh, somatostatin analogs like octreotide. Octreotide the dose is 50 microgram bolus followed by 50 microgram per hour infusion and that can be that should be given up to 5 days or other agents like terlipresin can be used. Uh, the dose is 2 mg bolus followed by 1 mg every 4 to 6 hour for 3 to 5 days and it can be started give before endoscopy uh, for bleeding control and reduction of mortality or we can use uh, vasopressin 0 0.1 to 0.5 units per minute for 4 to 12 hours or we can directly use somatostatin 250 microgram bolus followed by 250 microgram per hour infusion that can also reduce the portal pressure and uh, reduce the bleeding okay prophylactic antibiotics so uh, wherever blood is there it is a good medium for the bacteria to grow so uh, prophylactic antibiotics should be used uh, mostly Ceftriaxone can be used. Most Ceftriaxone 1 gram IV BD for 5 to 7 days can be used. All other alternative, uh, uh, alternative agents are flu fluoroquinolones. So we can use norfloxacin 400 mg BD also. Okay. So these are the medical management. And to know what bleeding it is, to know where the bleeding is, and to treat for that, we will have to do an upper GI endoscopy. Okay, so upper GI endoscopy, when to plan on upper GI endoscopy? So ideally, it is better to do it within 12 hours if the patient is having significant tachycardia, hypotension, uh, blood, uh, massive hematemesis or any large amount of blood coming in nasogastric aspirate and all. So depending on the patient's hemodynamic condition, if it is bad, we will have to uh, do it in 12 hours itself. And it, uh, urgent endoscopy means endos endoscopy done within 24 hours. Uh, this, uh, this is to identify the bleed and the nature of the bleeding. And it will predict the risk of recurrent bleeding from ulcer or varices, wherever it is. So, the advantage of doing an early endoscopy is that it will reduce the requirement for transfusion, reduce the risk for re-bleeding, decrease the uh, need for surgery and reduces the length of hospital stay. Okay. 
and by doing endoscopy we will be able to identify the source and we will be able to treat it also so uh, treatment can be either we can directly give injection of epinephrine diluted epinephrine one in thousand injection can be given or we can do some thermal therapies like uh, heater probes bipolar cautery or mechanical treatments like hemoclips uh, bands ligation like that okay and if we are not able to identify the source of bleed through an endoscopy we might have to plan doing a cct uh, an angiography and angioembolization of the bleed okay so this is a picture of an endoscopic band ligation of the varices so uh, the bands are there in the end of the endoscopic port and bands are placed the requirement for surgery that is decided based on the endoscopy result so uh, surgery is planned mostly based on the uh, amount of arterial bleed and if the requirement of transfusion is very high or if there is any uh, requ requirement for recurrent endoscopies and if there is any features of any surgical abdomen like GA perforation. Okay. Now, what is the role of beta blockers? So, beta blockers are used in variceal bleed to control the portal hypertension. So, non-selective beta blockers like propranol, the dose is 10 to 20 BD or carvedilol 3.125 mg BD and uh, or we can use nadalol 20 mg OD. These are used for splanic vasoconstruction and this is used in portal hypertension. So, uh, this can be started to prevent further GA bleeding. So, it is started in pa uh, patient with upper GA bleeding after treatment to prevent further GA bleeding and uh, for hemodynamic stability. Okay. Then rescue therapies like tips, these things and all, uh, the plan is made by the gastroenterologist whether to proceed with tips and all. Uh, tips is actually transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunts and all. Uh, this is only acts, used as a rescue therapy because there is high risk of abdominal hemorrhage, stent thrombosis, hepatic encephalopathy and all. So that was all about upper GA bleeding. Now we'll discuss about lower GA bleeding. So um, in an emergency point of view, the uh, upper, upper GA bleed is of more significance and lower GA bleed we will be discussing. Uh, we, uh, mostly the resuscitation, everything is same only. Lower GA bleed when it comes, most common causes are uh, diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, AV malformation, post polypectomy bleed, irritable bowel disease, neoplasm, infection, ulceration or any angioendric fistula or Meckel's diverticulum. These are some of the causes of lower GA bleed. And the difference between upper and lower GA bleed is the bleeding below the ligament of treats. Okay. And ab adverse prognostic factors of lower GA bleed is similar to that of upper GA bleed itself. That means presence of hypotension, tachycardia, reduced pulse pressure, tachypnea, angina, syncope, altered sensorium. These things are uh, poor prognostic factors. And repeated hematochesia, gross bleeding PR, a hematocrit less than 35, syncope and presence of more than two comorbidities are also adverse prognostic factors. And drugs are similar to that of upper GA bleed like aspirin, NSAIDs, anticoagulation agents, etc. Okay. Now so ex examination also, airway, breathing, circulation, whatever we discussed for upper GA bleed, same as for lower GA bleeding. And the requirement for intubation, uh, airway protection, these things will be less in lower GA bleeding okay this, uh, mostly the circulation part that means the uh, IV cannula fluid resuscitation requirement of PRBCs uh, the other blood products will be same as upper and lower GA bleeding and on systemic examination if there is any uh, some clues pointing towards the diagnosis is that if there is a history of uh, uh, um, history of previous aortic repair and all it can be because of an aortic endric fistula or if there is an abdominal tenderness and uh, recurrent episode history is there, it can be because of irritable bowel disease. And in lower GA bleeding, we should always examine the local, local area and the parietal area for laceration, masses, trauma, any fissures or hemorrhoids. And bedside, uh, anoscopy can also be done. Okay. 
so a uh, diagnosis uh, in case of lower gi blade is by doing a, a colonoscopy or uh, so it can diagnose diverticulosis and angiodysplasias and flexible endoscopy uh, sorry flexible sigmoidoscopy can be used to evaluate distal uh, colonic or rectal sources of bleeding and endoscopy can also be used because some uh, lower GA bleed can also be because of an upper GA bleed. So endoscopy, guided sclerotherapy, banding and electrocoagulation also can be done. And if at all we are not able to diagnose based on these scopies, then we can plan on doing an angiography. It can diagnose 0.5 ml per minute of bleeding in the abdomen. And if still that is not able to identify the source of bleed, we can plan on doing a scintigraphy to diagnose uh, bleeding. So that can diagnose up to 3 ml of blood in the GA tract. Okay. So this was all about upper GA bleed and lower GA bleed. Uh, we have discussed about the uh, uh, causes of upper GA bleed, uh, how to resuscitate the patient requirement for intubation, the restratification, the classification, and management, medical management and the endoscopic management. Thank you.